So as chair, then I welcome everybody, everybody to this. So our attendees are connected, though we can't see them. Is that correct, Louisa? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Welcome everybody um, to this hustings to select um, candidates for the House of Lords should we be offered another peerage. I'm Moira Dunworth and I'm chairing this hustings. Um, we have four candidates and that information is on the relevant page of the website. And they are uh, Molly Scott Cato, Rupert Reed, Andrew Cooper and Amelia Womack. The uh, procedure here is going to be that they have, they will have five minutes to make their opening statements and the order in which they do that will be randomized. So it's the reverse of, of the order that's on the website and thereafter they will have two minutes each to answer questions and again the order in which they ask to do that will be randomized. Uh, there is a chat function and a and a function at the bottom of your screen and the Q&A function is as the name suggests for questions so if you want to put any questions you want to put to the candidates up there and you can like or not other people's questions as well. Uh, we've had some pre-selected pre-submitted questions and we will take five of those to start with and then we will take some questions from the Q&A and possibly go back to the the pre-submitted ones depending. We have ordered the ones that are pre-submitted, we've ordered them in terms of the issues that they explore. Um, so this is a hustings and there are no procedural questions about the election process. Uh, any question will be directed to all four candidates um, and no question should be directed to any one candidate. I recommend that you select speaker view on your screen and it's kind of what it says on the tin. Um, and the chat is for technical questions. If you're having a problem with your sound or anything, that it's questions themselves need to go in the Q&A. And the chat function is not for running commentary, please, just for technical help, should you need it. Um, we're starting the sustings now and we will finish by 12.30. Um, so it's my great privilege to, to start this, this event. Um, I will first introduce um, the candidates and invite them to make an opening statement of not more than five minutes. Thereafter, as I think I've said with the questions, they'll have two minutes each to answer the questions, each question. So we're starting, please, with Molly Scott Cato. Um, Molly, would you like to, to tell us about yourself and your, your bid that we're discussing here? Thank you very much, Moira, and thanks for joining us for the hustings today. And it's nice to see my fellow candidates and it's, it's good actually that we're all mates. Um, so I'm standing here on my record as a, a member of the European Parliament and my expertise as a legislator. And the European Parliament is an amazing place to be a representative because you can actually make real legislative change as a member. <clears throat> it's not like being an MP where you're scrutinizing, you actually get involved in the nitty gritty of changing laws. And so I've had the experience of changing laws that I think will make a significant difference to life in the UK, even after we've left the EU. So some examples of that, I worked on the Economics and Monetary Policy Committee and I focused particularly on tax reform from the very beginning and stopping tax avoidance. And I was part of the movement of the Greens leading um, the really radical assault on tax avoidance across the world, in fact, and really changing tax transparency and stopping rich people and corporations from hiding their money away. And I think that's typical of the sort of issue I could work on in the House of Lords because it kind of combines the need to take radical positions in public but also have a, a grip of the detail and I was able to talk about that on a lot of platforms where I think I help people understand what is really quite technical detail because I've got a grip on it I can help to share that more widely and also take greens into an area where we're not usually thought to be strong. Other issues where I was successful was uh, for example I was the Parliament's Rapporteur on Sustainable Finance so I worked across the 750 MEPs pulling together a strong position on how to use finance to move us forward in the sustainability transition. And that included some campaigning and lobbying started by me to stop the European Investment Bank investing in fossil fuel projects, which was effective um, a couple of months after I left the parliament. 
Um, I also worked a lot on farming as a member of the Agriculture Committee because um, I represent the South West, it's a big issue here. I was able to work towards limits on antibiotic use, so working against antibiotic resistance and also on pesticide use. And um, I think those are just some examples of how I've actually been effective as a legislator, and that's my best argument for becoming a member of the House of Lords. But I've also got a lot of constitutional expertise and understanding that I think would, would make me a strong peer. And the House of Lords is effectively an expert amending and improving uh, chamber. And so for me, success as a peer needs three types of skills. Firstly, the experience of working in a, in a legislative chamber, which as I explained, I, I have. Secondly, the ability to assimilate detailed policy in lots of different areas and be able to use that to see opportunities to make green changes directly or to advance the argument for, for green policies. Because every single law that goes through in this country will go to the Lords and that can feel a bit overwhelming at first, but actually the, the key to success there is to look for opportunities, maybe in obscure places, where you can put in an amendment and really start a debate going on something that really matters to us as Greens and to our voters. And the third really important skill is to be able to work with people from other parties. And obviously that's something that I did here in Stroud when I um, negotiated to take power away from the Tories and the Greens still a part of the administration here in Stroud, but also reaching across and working with Tories and working with people from all the other parties, in fact, apart from the fascist ones, obviously, in the European Parliament. So again, that's something I've got experience of. I've got a wide base of knowledge across issues and countries. I've worked a lot on Latin America and Tibet. I obviously have wide experience and contacts with lots of different European countries. I've also got fairly good knowledge of, of a range of issues. Obviously, I'll, I'll talk about economics later, but also climate, renewables, um, farming, social security, housing. I'm, I'm a sort of knowledge person, so I think that will be a useful addition to the, to the House of Lords. During my time as an M MEP, I built up contacts and I've got a good, networking, a good network now across media, across other European Greens, but also Crucially, I was able to impress and sometimes I hope terrify um, representatives from other political parties. And I would say I'm not a part of the swamp, but I do have the ability to work well within the system. So hopefully I'm getting that balance between being a radical outsider and being an effective operator within the system. Just about right. So I'm, I'm really keen to do this work. Thank you, second. Thank you very much. I'm really keen to get stuck in um, in the House of Lords. Obviously, it would be would be a beautiful thing to be a, an MP, but I've tried that quite a few times, and I'm now wanting to be able to be effective in terms of legislation in the second chamber to work with Jenny and Natalie, both of whom I've known for a long time and work with very well, and use my expertise on issues like economics, sustainable finance, the Green New Deal, and tax tax avoidance to really reinforce the work they're already doing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly, and thank you so much for keeping to time. And is that okay, candidates, that I give you a 30-second warning, just verbally or with my hand? Um, I'll just do it verbally because there's enough to be looking at. So thanks, Molly. And the next um, person that I invite to make the opening statement is Rupert. So you've got four strong candidates to choose from here. I've got five minutes to convince you to vote for me, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to take two minutes because I believe that what these hustings are really all about is hearing from you and debate and dialogue, which I love. So I'm just going to say two things. The first is, please watch my video that I've made for this campaign. Please, after this hustings, if you haven't yet seen it, go to www.rupertreed.net and click on House of Lords. And you'll see the video I've got there. And I think that will show you why I think I'm a very strong public voice for this party to have in Parliament. And the second thing I'll say is that I've got a very strong record of working with our existing parliamentarians, especially in this context, I'd like to highlight that I've worked closely with Jenny since the start of her time in the House of Lords. I've drafted speeches for her. I've drafted questions for her. I've given her information which she can use as ammunition in meetings with government ministers. So if you send me to the Lords, I'll hit the ground running with my strong record of working with her, Natalie and Caroline, with, all, with whom I also have a very strong 
professional relationship over many years. So there you go, two minutes, two things. I think that's enough. I look forward to talking with you now and I look forward, I hope, to representing you in the House of Lords. Thank you very much, Rupert. That was actually only a minute and a half. Thank there you, you so very much for that. Um, so, Andrew, we hear from you next, please. Okay, um, I'm a councillor. Uh, I was first elected 21 years ago to Kirklees Council in West Yorkshire. I've been elected and re-elected six times to the News and Ward, uh, where we've won every local election since 1996. That is a record 18 local election wins on the trot. I've been Green Party Energy spokesperson for a few years now, and I've done many press, TV and radio interviews speaking on renewable energy, insulation standards and the folly of fossil fuels. I've worked for over 20 years in the energy efficiency and renewable energy sector in both the public and private sector, managing projects, developing policy and representing the renewable energy industry. I do have a life outside politics. Um, I'm a local government association peer mentor for all green councillors, providing help and support to the 300 plus councillors we have, many of whom are very new. I've been a member of several local government association policy boards and through that I've given direct policy input to government ministers. I've also provided evidence to a parliamentary select committee of MPs on the need for more funding for flood defences. I have been ignored by some very important people. Um, I was a member of the EU Committee of the Regions for the last five years and through that an EU delegate to four of the most recent UN climate talks. So why, why the House of Lords? Um, I think it would send a strong statement for the Green Party uh, to send an elected politician to the unelected House of Lords. I represent a constituency. Uh, I can speak with authority and authenticity about the impact of government policies on local people, just like an MP can. So what would I bring to Parliament? Uh, I'm one of very few Green politicians who's actually initiated and implemented Green Party policies. I successfully proposed the UK's first universally free insulation scheme in Kirklees. Over 50,000 homes were insulated and the Kirklees Warm Zone scheme won national awards and national recognition. I proposed a policy effectively banning fracking in our council area in our local plan by establishing that any planning application for fracking would have to demonstrate how it would have to have net zero impact on climate change. This approved policy set a precedent for all councils around the country. I've influenced global policy by getting a stronger focus on local climate action at the UN climate talks by forging alliances with local and regional governments internationally. For me, this feels like the right time. I wouldn't want to do this role 20 years ago uh, without all the experience I've gained being an elected politician. I think it gives me more legitimacy in a chamber with a dubious legitimacy. I also like having a strong link with the many diverse communities that I represent. It keeps my feet on the ground and all politicians need that. I know both Jenny and Natalie well, having worked with them for many years, so I know we would make a great team. Obviously we're different, have different strengths, different backgrounds, different skills, but that's what makes for good teams. So what would be my priorities in the House of Lords? Well, addressing climate change is a very strong focus for me. I've had some real success at getting innovative policies adopted, and that means being aware to opportunities, negotiating with other parties, and getting legislation passed. I'd also like to see an end to the right to buy council of council houses because we desperately need more social housing for those on the very lowest incomes. And we need to build thousands of new low energy demand council houses. So please support me. Andrew Cooper is your first choice on the House of Lords ordered list. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Four minutes. That's absolutely great. Not that this is a reverse race or anything. And <laughs> finally, for opening statements, um, can I invite Amelia? to address us. Thank you, Moira, and uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Amelia Womack, and after you've elected me for an unprecedented three terms as your deputy leader, I'm asking you to put your faith in me and vote for me first preference for the House of Lords. I believe that politics at its best is when hope delivers change, and that's what I want to deliver in the House of Lords. 
As a scientist with the qualifications to back it up, I want to ensure that we have genuine scientific scrutiny on the diverse and, and complex issues of the day. As Greens, we want a genuine Green New Deal to ensure that we tackle the climate and ecological emergency while addressing inequality. That scrutiny must come from a scientific perspective, a skill so lacking within our upper chamber. I want to represent diversity of, of thought as well as diversity of voice. Just 5% of the Lords are under the age of 50. The average age is 69 and just 26% are women. We see a young generation whose voice has been severely lacking in politics. And around the world, we see a seismic shift of that agenda changing. From Finland, America, New Zealand, young women are proving our power in politics when we're given the platforms to ensure that underrepresented voices are being heard, are being part of the conversations, are at the table and are making change happen. I have recently been, uh, my work has recently been uh, acknowledged on an international level, having been shortlisted for the One World Young Politician of the Year, proving the power of young people when we are elected, when we have seats, when we ensure that we have representation for a generation. I've worked tirelessly with dignity and state uh, um, across uh, the, the whole country for the Green Party, making sure that I'm listening to you, making sure that I'm representing your values from your communities, from your doorsteps to ensuring that we're, we're, we're I'm talking about the policies that are important to you in uh, media interviews, in policy changes. I have uh, been on nearly every news channel. I've taken on Piers Morgan and Andrew Neil. I've been making sure that our uh, ra rational yet radical politics are heard in newspapers, in magazines, ensuring that we are being heard time and time again. I am already representing the Green Party in committees in the House of Lords. I have already worked cross party to ensure that we change the agenda on issues such as women's rights, collaborating with MPs and members of the House of Lords to ensure that we're, we're, we're getting uh, the change that so desperately needs to happen. I have already influenced the national conversation, having co-founded Another Europe is Possible, the left-wing Remain campaign, to ensure that we're changing the conversation on one of the most important issues of our time and making sure that there's a left critique, making, speaking out on behalf of, of workers' rights, human rights, environmental protection and peace. I know that as Greens, we will only send somebody to the House of Lords that will disrupt the cosy consensus of the stuffy elected, uh, unelected second chamber. We will only send someone who will want institutional reform uh, of the House of Lords. And that's what you will get with me. We need to be making sure that we send a Trojan horse, somebody who will think differently, somebody who will make change happen, and somebody who will ensure that we work across the country, listening to voices and getting our unique agenda effectively communicated at all channels possibly possible. That's what you'll get with me. Do you elect me, Amelia Womack, first preference for the House of Lords? Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you so much for, to all of you. Um, I want to move now to the first question, the first pre-submitted question, which is, and we're going to start with Rupert. Um, we're going to have Rupert, Molly, Amelia and Andrew. So Rupert, can you tell us your number one priority if you join the House of Lords? Mm, yeah. Well, uh, sorry, I've got to tell you about three uh, top priorities for the House of Lords. Climate, climate and climate. If you make me a Lord, I will put the ecological and climate emergency absolutely centrally on the nation's agenda in the way I have been doing for the last several years. Through my talks, which have been getting hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube, through the media and, of course, in the parliamentary chamber. I would prioritize climate and ecology absolutely in what I do, because this is the existential crisis that we face. This is the set of issues by which we will be judged by our children. And believe you me, if we get it wrong, as looks incredibly likely, we will be judged. So I will be tireless on this set of issues. Of course, what that actually means, in fact, 
is it's across the whole piece. So for example, one area that I would focus on quite a lot, an area that I've got a lot of expertise in and that I've been a national spokesperson for the Green Party for for several years in the past is transport. Transport is an absolutely key area if we are to make the kind of progress we need to on climate and ecology. I've been pushing quite hard recently, for example, against HS2, that's just one of many examples. When I was a, a two-term councillor in Norwich, I led on getting 20 mile an hour speed limits rolled out across the residential areas in Norwich, so that now over a third of Norwich has 20 mile an hour zones. And that was a tremendous achievement to be able to uh, initiate. Um, very, very gratifying to see that every day when I, when I go around the, uh, the, the fine city that we have here in Norwich. So I think that's clear, climate and ecological emergency, climate and ecological emergency, climate and ecological emergency, mitigation and adaptation. These will be my absolute focuses as they, as they have been in my academic work and for the last few years on the stump. Thank you so much, Rupert, thank you. Um, and Molly, can I ask you next about your number one priority if you join the House of Lords? Sure, you won't be surprised to hear me say that uh, economics will be my number one priority as a policy issue, but I'm going to talk a little bit first about the absolute priority of defending democracy at the moment. Um, I, I think we can all see that our democracy is seriously under threat, and I've, for the past two or three years, been really finding out a lot more about how the far right is attacking democracy through Brexit, through manipulating our electoral system, through stealing our data through abusing Facebook and other social media platforms and so on. And now we see those people at the heart of government. And I think for everybody who believes in democracy, this must be our priority because there's no point in doing anything else if they have trashed our democracy to such an extent that it's no longer functioning effectively. So I have to say I have a long standing interest in uh, constitutional affairs. I studied with Rupert in Oxford by all the, the, the great thinkers who are now probably advising people who are trashing democracy, but nonetheless it does give you a good grounding in how constitutions work. I'm actually quite nerdily fascinated by that whole, that whole discussion. I worked with Unite to Reform over an electoral agreement before the last general election and I'm absolutely determined that we will not let Labour carry on blocking proportional representation because that it's their fault that we've got these endless Tory governments destroying democracy and destroying our country. So anyway, written constitution, democratic second chamber, fair voting system, these are total priorities for all of us. But um, in terms of policy, obviously what I hope to take into the House of Lords is my famous status as a professor of economics and hopefully, you know, start to disturb <laughs> Tories as I've done quite a few times in my life in being the person in the room that knows the most about economics. Am I running out of time, Moira? I thought I had, I thought I had just done a minute and I had another minute. Not um, really, yes. 15 seconds, yeah. So, yeah, so, so basically I've spent a career uh, and a lifetime really trying to work out how it is exactly that the economy destroys our climate, destroys our society, causes this ecological crisis we're living through. And I've actually come up with quite a lot of answers on that. And they've also turned into practical policies, whether it's sustainable finance, the carbon tax, um, the Green New Deal. So oh, those true. are the kinds of issues where I think I could really bring some authority to our work in the laws. Thank you. Yes, and sorry, I thought when you were running out of time, you were making a kind of life um, reflection. <laughs> and I was, I was nodding. <laughs> I never, okay, yeah. I never do that, Moira, don't oh, worry. <laughs> geez, I do that. I do that all the time. My apologies. Thank you so much, Molly. That's great. Uh, um, um, Andrew is next. No, Amelia, I'm so sorry, Amelia, I want, we want to give you a chance to tell us about your number one priority if you join the House of Lords. My number one priority is the Green New Deal, which is a cheeky statement because I believe the Green New Deal is effectively Green Party policy repackaged. But on a serious note, I think effectively making sure that I bring that scientific knowledge into the House of Lords means that I want to ensure that we are talking about the climate and ecological emergency, as Rupert said, from a scientific perspective. But I appreciate that also talking about the diversity that needs to be brought into the House of Lords. I've already seen the work on women's rights being severely lacking in terms of what's being pushed to ensure that we're working for equality for women as well as equality across the board. I also think that it's interesting that when you look at uh, committees and representatives that are talking about issues such as youth engagement in politics, they're represented by people who are over the age of 80. 
by making sure that I'm speaking out on issues that are relevant to a generation, whether that's the failure of, a, of um, the uh, of tuition fees, whether that's the failure of policy that has made, meant that the rights of young people have been undermined. I think it's vitally important that that voice is represented. So I want to ensure that we embed scientific scrutiny, we push for those climate targets as an ending ecocide campaigner and somebody who has been working in the environmental sector uh, since uh, for years, I need to be making sure that we're pushing that environmental perspective in every single opportunity, as well as making sure that I take advantage of the diversity that I would represent. That's great. Thanks very much, Amelia. And um, Andrew, if I can ask you the same question, your number one priority. And remember to unmute yourself because you're currently muted. Great stuff, lovely. Um, so it would be delivering a zero carbon economy um, by 2030 uh, in line with the climate emergency uh, that we all face. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's a fairly specific thing and, we, and, it, and it's w w what we need to achieve. To achieve that, we're going to need to uh, be working across sectors. Uh, we're going to need to be working with communities, with individuals. We're going to be, need to be, but we also need national government, regional government, devolved administrations and local government to be working uh, together. Now they should be, uh, but they aren't. And one of the things that came out of the COP24 uh, climate talks uh, was, a, was a commitment uh, by all governments around the world to work with uh, their, their devolved governments. Now, as, uh, as somebody who's involved in local government, I, I know that that simply is not happening, that there are no memos, there's no joint working, none of that's happening. And through the Local Government Association, I'm currently working, um, trying to get national government ministries to actually work directly, local government ministries to work directly, to directly with us. So getting a plan together is, is fundamental, uh, because at the moment it's all very, very ad hoc. Uh, we can see opportunities, opportunities arise to do positive things. I mean, the government's announced a voucher scheme recently, and we've got to be aware to, of opportunities, a voucher scheme for insulation. Now, one of the things I've been proposing is that uh, local government and national government work together on this so we can make some of those schemes free, uh, yeah, just, like the ones, just like the ones we've achieved in Kirklee. So, yes, we've got to address climate change with a plan, but we've also got to look for opportunities uh, as we go along. Thank you so very much. Um, and we're moving to the second um, on our list of submitted, pre-submitted questions. Um, and this one is, how will you use the procedures and processes of the House to further the green agenda? What opportunities will it give you to make our influence more inclusive? And I want to start this time with Amelia, please. Thank you. In terms of inclusive, in making it inclusive, it's vital we ensure that we're listening to everybody's voices. Um, I think that's something that's really powerful of the work that we do as the Green Party and the work that I've done over my years as deputy leader, ensuring engaging with so many different communities across the country, um, including, of course, this seat will represent Northern Ireland, Scotland, as well as Wales when it comes to the green agenda and being from Wales and understanding uh, devolution and the role that we need to be making sure to, to represent Welsh voices and uh, divorce, divorce, voices from other nations is so vitally important as well as the processes themselves that we need to be making sure that we're smart, that we're making sure that we are tweaking but creating radical changes at the same time. I think we've pr have proven with the work that I've done, as I said, cross-party already to make sure that we're challenging some of the status quo um, when it comes to that policy. But effectively, inclusivity means that effective communication needs to come behind that, making sure that we are uh, getting our voice heard because within the House itself, we will only be talking to the bubble. We may Make movements happen when we bring people with us. We make change happen when we represent the grassroots. And I think what's important is being in the House of Lords shouldn't just be about uh, talking within that bubble. It needs to ensure that we are bringing people along with us and creating, using that platform to build our voice, our movement through change in policy process as well as in communication. Lovely. Just uh, I was going to shout my 30 seconds at you. Thanks very much, Amelia. And can I ask Molly the same question, which is when, how will you use the procedures and processes of the House to further the Green Agenda and what opportunities will it give you to make our influence more inclusive? 
Well, obviously, as I already said, understanding how legislative negotiations works is really important to getting this right, because it's basically about the need to compromise, the need to understand the extent of your power, the need to, to work together with other people, whether that's um, Labour peers or Tory peers, you know, and I think the experience I've had in, in the European Parliament is absolutely perfect practice, really, for the, for the way you actually make effective change in the House of Lords. But in terms of how I work as a politician, I've always found that the most important thing is to focus on a small number of issues. And as Greens, we always tend to have a lot of bright ideas about everything. And I'm like that myself as well. And we also obviously are a small number of people covering a wide number of issues. But I was incredibly strict with myself as an MEP and I had a, only 10 issues I allowed myself or my team to work on. And sometimes uh, 10 was too many. And I think that ability to focus and to, to, to be opportunistic across the board, but to really keep banging on about certain issues. It's not only important because you, you find out who the other people to work with are and you learn more about the issue. It's also important because the media start to identify you with that issue. And after a while they do, when they're thinking about the story, they do realise that you're somebody who's got something to say. So I think focus is, is really important. And obviously I would focus on issues around the economy, tax, finance, issues where we're not considered to be particularly strong at the moment and and I would hope I hope I've already in fact add to our authority by focusing on on those particular issues um, and I would also say in terms of diversity I think it's important that people who have positions elected positions as we do, still, do start to mentor and encourage people from different communities from different liberation groups younger people in the party because we need to make sure that we look like the communities we represent and we, we, I think we're much stronger than we were, but I think we often have a reputation for not being very uh, diverse as the Green Party. So I think that's something any of us would happily commit to. And I think it's something we mm. should be held yeah. to account for um, whoever ends up as the next person in the House of Lords. And lastly, the, the other reason I would make an impact is because I'm and a very hard worker, I'm diligent and I'm consistent. And I think and those are important. And qualities. you're out of time. <laughs> and I speak Thank very you. briefly always. <laughs> Indeed, you're all doing marvellously well. Thank you so much for keeping the time. Thanks very much, Molly. And Andrew, I'm going to ask you the same question, which is how you use the procedures and processes of the House to further the Green Agenda and the opportunities to make our influence more inclusive. Okay. So uh, one of the great things about being a member of the House of Lords is you're able to ask parliamentary questions uh, which demand answers. And so uh, the power of a good question is really important. And that's, a, that's an important part of the, uh, the process and procedures of being in the House of Lords. So uh, I've done that. I've, um, through Jenny, I've uh, put questions um, to the House of Lords uh, and uh, got responses. And sometimes by simply asking the question, you actually get uh, government and ministers thinking about things they would not think about otherwise. Amendments, putting amendments forward, making sure those amendments are well uh, thought <laughs> through uh, are, and that you're actually working with people who are affected is really important as well. Parliamentary groups, working with the right parliamentary groups, putting that time in so you're getting that you're representing people. One of the things that I would want to do is uh, involve uh, myself with PRASEG, uh, the Parliamentary Renewable and Sustainable Energy Group, uh, which I've spoken to in, in the past. Uh, and so that's a group that I would, I would particularly want to involve to get that voice for the renewable industry and uh, energy efficiency industries. As far as inclusivity goes, um, I represent uh, an area which has a large Muslim population, um, large council estates. Uh, I represent people on uh, the very lowest of incomes. Uh, this is not a, a leafy green ward. It's, um, and so, so one of the things that I would do in that way, I would be able to give the very real life experience of people who are affected by government policy. And, and that is invaluable in a place where you have so many people who don't represent who don't represent anybody. And so to have somebody elected in the House of Lords, particularly for those communities, is vital. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and Rupert, finally. Yes, yeah, so this is a really important question. It follows on from the first question, I think, really. As I said in answer to that question, I would focus quite strongly in the Lords on the climate and ecological emergency, which is an enormous piece to focus on. What the Lords really like, uh, and this is one of the ways that in which, and I've seen quite a lot of parliamentary debates, the Lords can often be a better place, actually, than the Commons in terms of quality of debate. The Lords like expertise. 
uh, and I would bring my expertise to bear. As I've already described, that would include in relation to transport, but it would also include in, in relation to the precautionary principle, which has been at the heart of my academic uh, work and also some popular work over the last uh, several years. It would include the economic uh, valuation of nature, which I've been very critical of. I've had two academic grants, which have, both of which have resulted in me hosting and speaking at meetings uh, in Parliament, academic grants on so-called ecosystem services and natural capital, um, counting the, uh, the so supposed economic value of forests and oceans and so on and so forth, which I think is a very questionable way of, uh, of looking at things. There's more on that in my video, by the way. Uh, reminder, www.rupertreed.net. Um, and uh, so I would bring that expertise to bear uh, in the House of Lords, and also my expertise on potential societal collapse because I would be a voice very much telling the truth about the extreme fragility of the situation in which we are now uh, in, on how it's too late for a mitigation only type approach to climate. We also exactly. have to be adapting to the climate disasters which tragically uh, are baked in. This country is radically underprepared for that, for example, in terms of the solidity of our food supply. And I would be using my expertise as a systems thinker to make strong forays on the parliamentary level into that absolutely vital area. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. Um, while the next question is a very long question, goes on the screen, I'm just going to say that the order in which we're taking the candidates for this question is Andrew, Rupert, Molly and Amelia. When we got the pre-submitted questions, we did put together ones which seemed to be closely related, shall we say, and this is one of those. Um, so it, it's up there so that it's quite, we'll just give you a moment to have a read of it, but I, I do think it's a fairly straightforward question and very relevant question, which is why it's been chosen as number three. How best prepared are you to manage the heat directed at the party in relation to the party's stance on non-environmental matters, such as housing laws and legislation, the welfare state and processes which fundamentally govern and outline the lives of a cross-section of society, including, but, and I think I make long sentences, sorry, cross-section of society, including, but not limited to the implementation of a higher standard of living for children and young people, disabled people and elderly people. Clearly that question has not been edited by, by us. So just give you a moment. And then when you're ready, Andrew, you have two minutes. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, anytime. I'm everybody's okay. friend. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, so let's let's have a go at this. Um, I, I, I suppose you, you, they mentioned you, they mentioned in the question specifically about housing law and legislation. Now I, I've worked as a state management manager uh, on a council uh, estate. That, that was where I started my uh, my local government career, and I, I've worked there. So I, I, I'm used to seeing the real problems of everyday life. And of course, as a councillor. I, I look at the impact of uh, national government policies in, in real time. Uh, I, I see what's going on. And so being able to talk about that, being able to give real life examples is, is, is so important. And it's not just about housing, of course, uh, you get pulled in to deal with welfare issues. Uh, and so w when people talk about things being in a, in a highfalutin way or, or in a way which is um, uh, detached, uh, I can talk about those things it, it, as, as a reality. Um, reflecting a cross-section of society, the area I represent has got a population of 15,000 people um, across quite a wide area. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, it's got a large Muslim population, it's got a large uh, council estate population, it's got some more well-to-do areas, uh, even some farms. Uh, and so it is very much a cross-section of, of, of the community. Uh, and one of the things I, I, I love doing is uh, getting involved with community organizations and getting to know people really well. And getting to know those people well, you know, uh, particularly people from the Muslim population, uh, means there's a much greater understanding about their needs and the things that, that they care about. So for me, uh, having that background and that knowledge is a really big advantage uh, when going for this role. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. And Rupert, are you good or do you want to see that on the slide again, if anybody wants to see that Actually, again? could you put the slide up, Maura, so we can, yeah. uh, we can all see it? Yeah. I can't. Louisa will. So I'll start answering anyway while we're waiting for that. So I want to gently challenge the 
question, which talks about the party's stance on non-environmental matters. But actually, I think most of the things that are then named have an environmental dimension. That's what I was trying to say yeah. before, that yeah. climate and ecology is a huge sway. It's not just one issue. That's a mistake that's often made in our society and that we've sometimes made in the past. So housing, for example, uh, absolutely vital to be clear on the ecological and climate dimensions of housing laws uh, and legislation. Now you might say in response, yes, but what about people's standard of living? That, that isn't exhausted by these ecological matters, is it? And of course that's quite correct. But what we need to do, I think, is we need to distinguish between standard of living and quality of life. So standard of living means basically the amount of material stuff that you have. Quality of life means how good your life is. And the way I see what we're trying to do in the Green Party is to improve quality of life while no longer pretending that we're going to be able to have higher material standards of living forever. And, you know, I think we've been given a huge boost here by the unanticipated upside of the appalling experience of the coronavirus pandemic. What I'm referring to is the way that so many of us have experienced during lockdown how, in some important respects, our quality of life can be better while we're spending less, buying less, consuming less. So many people have noticed the birds singing more, the pleasure of not having planes going overhead the whole time, the that levels of accurate. traffic, the levels of traffic that are still lower than they used to be. What we must say now is no going back, no going back to how it was before the COVID-19 pandemic. We've got to bake in these gains. And if we do that, we'll improve quality of living for the groups mentioned in the question and for us all potentially, and we'll do it in a way that doesn't trash the environment. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, um, Rupert. And the next up for the, this question is Molly, please. Okay, well, I interpret that question rather differently. And, and my response to the question will be to say that capitalism sucks. And it's my conviction that, that that's the case. And that's why I wrote a book called Market Market. And I think the way the economy is organized is deliberately intended to victimize and exploit certain groups. And it's our job as politicians to not only defend them, but to change the system. So it doesn't depend on exploiting certain groups. And I would say that we've always been a lot more radical than labor on that because labor basically I'm sort of assuming this heat may come from Labour, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, Labour essentially accept that idea that you're a wage slave and if you don't work you starve. They're just like the other side of the coin from the Tories. We've always been far more radical than that and made claims on actual ownership of resources and the idea of the economy as commonwealth that would undercut this sort of view um, of an economy that, that creates winners and losers. We are now moving into a phase where we're going to see a lot of job losses. And what we have to do as Greens is absolutely resist the idea that somehow cutting um, jobs and cutting public spending and cutting the debt that we have as a country could possibly be a good thing. That is the way towards a, a global depression of unprecedented proportions. And I think as Greens, we have the courage to say that. We have the courage to reject that distinction between strivers and skivers, which shamefully Labour accepted under Ed Miliband and they're now moving back to that sort of position. Everybody claims benefits if they're lucky enough to live into retirement and we should absolutely champion universal benefits like UBI and reject the stigmatisation of people on the welfare state. In terms of housing, we have to reject the idea that you're a failure if you live in rented housing, improve conditions for renters, improve social rented housing and obviously improve the quality of the housing through retrofit. I think on this agenda, it's not that we're coming under heat, it's that we need to put that heat back onto Labour as they start to abandon aspects of uh, some of the victims of, of this economic system in order to win the votes of the majority. That's great. Thank you very much. Perfect timing, Molly. Perfect timing. I'm sorry I didn't have, don't have sweeties for rewards here, <laughs> although it would, it would get a little complicated. That's lovely. Can I now ask uh, Amelia to answer this long Thank question, you, please? I believe that all of these issues are intertwined, making sure that we're talking about environmental and social justice um, a, a, as a unit. When you look at these systems, I believe that you've got the, it's kind of like a, a triangle upside down. You've got the environment at the top. It's the environment that we use for our water, for our food, to make sure that we're able to have housing. It's uh, people who then use that environment to make the goods and resources that create business and therefore create the economy. 
There is no economy on a dead planet. There are no, there's no economy without people. There's no business if, we, if we're not putting in that investment into our people and our environment as well. By making sure that we're drawing those connections, we can prove what Greens really stand for. And that is an equitable society that makes sure that we're challenging the status quo for, the, for, for future generations to ensure that we're protecting, uh, protecting them from a climate and ecological emergency, but making sure that we address inequalities around all of these issues. We've got a lot of work to do, but if we're not fighting for all of that together, then what the hell are we fighting for? Because everything we do, it must be about people, about planet, and about creating a better future, not just for now, but ensuring that we've got representatives who are there, who in my mind would be Greens, making sure that there's long-term policy embedded to ensure that we are tackling every single ounce of aspect of these issues. Wonderful. Okay, you get your chocolate, sweetie. Um, that was a minute and a half. Thank you very much indeed. Um, question, you'll be pleased to know all of the remaining questions are shorter. You will be glad to know. <laughs> and the next round is going to be Amelia, Rupert, Molly and Andrew in that order. And so question number four is what significant achievement do you have that demonstrate or demonstrate a range of experience, skills and competencies that would make you suitable for the House of Lords candidate. So we will start with Amelia. So for me, it's on women's rights. As I mentioned before, I've worked cross party as well as with individuals like Helen Pankhurst to make sure that we're scrutinizing and changing policy when it comes to women. That's making sure that I've been working with MPs and members of the House of Lords to look at policy and embed changes that need to happen. The biggest of these has been around misogyny as a hate crime, where I spoke, spoke about my own experiences of domestic violence to make sure that we were making changes to protect women um, through securing better policy. This cross-party work has led to um, effectively a review of hate crime policy, uh, making sure that we are, are creating that change. But it also meant that there was, as I said before, that communication about why it's important that we're embedding women's rights and actually challenging the status quo of the experiences that women have. Um, that cross-party work has continued during coronavirus, making sure that we have challenged and worked together to talk about issues such as uh, protecting women who are in abusive relationships during lockdown. It's so vitally important that we are speaking out for people who, when our doors open up properly, there are going to be so many stories that have just been behind closed doors that are going to, going to come out in terms of uh, people, women's experiences during lockdown. It's women that have been harmed. Uh, I think um, I do want to continue, I have been continuing that work over the last six years and I think what's been powerful about it is that making sure that we're looking at the policy, uh, making sure that we are collaborating, making sure that we're bringing those strong voices in, but making sure that change does happen because, because we need to ensure that we're creating something better tomorrow um, out of, as a result of all of our hard work. Great, thank you so very much Amelia and uh, Rupert. Next, uh, what significant achievements in terms of experience, skills and competencies for yeah. this role? Yeah, so I've already mentioned my relevant expertises. Let me say a little something about my ability as uh, a debater, which you can see in spades on that video. So I have a long and deep experience as a debater using parliamentary style processes. When I was at Oxford, I debated against uh, Boris Johnson. I beat Michael Gove uh, in a debate. I, I debated with uh, Simon Stevens, the head of the NHS uh, now. And I think it's safe to say that I'm a very strong debater and very persuasive. Uh, and that can really make a difference in the House of Lords. Because as I say, while on the one hand, the House of Lords is clearly a place that needs, badly needs reform. On the other hand, it does have its upsides. It does have a serious ability sometimes to listen to intelligence, expertise, rhetorical persuasion of a high order. Uh, and I've shown that, I believe, in recent years with the encounters I've had in the media, for example, with uh, Martha Carney, uh, Michael Crick, um, on the Question Time on the Today programme with, uh, with John Humphreys, uh, on Politics Live, uh, with Nick Ferrari, Jacob Rees-Mogg, that was an interesting one on his show. 
Um, if you go and listen to any of those, I think you'll find that it's safe to say that I never get bested by the, uh, by the interviewer or by the person I'm debating with. Uh, and uh, I think that that's not something that, to be honest, that everybody can say. Uh, and I would bring that talent to bear inside the House of Lords, and I would bring it to bear in the media <laughs> and on the stump, uh, and I think that you would not be disappointed. Thank you so much indeed, Rupert. Um, and Molly, next, please. So I'm going to briefly mention three things, and one is something I already referred to, which is being the European Parliament's Rapporteur on Sustainable Finance. And what that meant really for me was bringing my 10 years of working as an economist in university, so developing knowledge on how the economy works and how finance works, and starting to really apply that to making sure that finance was moved away from the dirty industries of the past and towards the clean industries of the future. And it was, I've got to say, in a nerdy way, pretty thrilling because most people in the parliament knew nothing about this. And I was able to sort of persuade and yeah, really sort of cajole sometimes. Anyway, negotiation, that's what it's called, isn't it? But it was based on the knowledge that I had and being able to use that in a way that really changed laws. And so I, I sat in a room with three other people and we rewrote a piece of law between us on, on benchmarks, which is about how institutional investors decide where their money goes. And billions of money will go in a different direction because we did that work and then persuaded other politicians to accept it. And then my job was to go and advocate on behalf of this agenda, which I've done across Europe from the Vatican to the ECB in Frankfurt, as I say in my statement. So to me, this is something that was achieved. It required quite a lot of compromise, but big changes are happening and will happen now because of that work that we did and it was based on it was nice for me that it was based on knowledge using knowledge to achieve power i've also in terms of outreach i think i've done a good job really giving us some credibility with the farming community and i've got a good relationship now with minette batters who lives in wiltshire so was one of my constituents seconds. and is now the, the president of the nfu and I think I've helped to convince farmers that actually we're the best option for them. And I can tell you, I wouldn't have expected to be able to do that. And lastly, in terms of media, I agree. I, I love watching Rupert on the telly as well, but I take a slightly different tack and I've tried to establish this role as like the voice of reason when I'm saying outrageously radical green policies. And I, I, people often say to me, you sound like the voice of reason whenever you come on the radio. And it doesn't matter how radical it is what I'm saying. So. I, I think that's something that I could offer as Thank a board, you. and I've also that's survived great. Andrew Neil, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think I did okay. Thank you very much, Molly. Um, and Andrew, finally. Yeah, I, I've also survived Andrew Neil uh, on the in the 2015 <laughs> climate um, hustings uh, that uh, we did on BBC uh, today. Um, yeah, free insulation scheme uh, that we achieved in Kirklees, the 50,000 homes that were insulated, di didn't think of that really uh, as um, in, in many ways on its own. We looked at it and used it and, and went to government and said, look, government, we can do this in one council in one part of the country. Why can't we do this nationwide? And so the achievements I have, I always look at what we can do to actually make more of those. The fracking ban uh, that we achieved um, in our local plan. Um, when we got that passed, some Conservative council said, oh, well, there's not much opportunity to frack in Kirklees. I said, yeah, you're right. But because we passed this policy, it means that every council in the rest of the country will be able to do that. Um, at COP24, um, when I, um, I, I went there and uh, through my role with the EU Committee of the Regions, um, I, um, I'd worked with um, the Committee of the Regions to get the local government uh, association for the globally to actually back my policy of locally determined contributions. Now that policy influenced directly the outcome of the climate talks at COP24 and now our government should be talking to us. So the things I do at a very local level, being a councillor, have had global impact. Uh, and so I do get involved in, in lots of projects in, in that way, always looking at the institution I'm involved with and seeing which levers you can pull to achieve things. Um, I, I've got quite a long list of things I have achieved. And, and you I'm have 30 gonna... seconds. All oh, right, okay. Well, anyway, I'm going to do a Rupert and direct people to <laughs> andrewcooper.green, uh, my website, which has got, a, has got a tab and you just go down it and it just scrolls achievements. Uh, and so uh, please have a look at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I, I do realise that this, it's very difficult to answer, you know, really important issues in two minutes, but thank you all for your patience with that. So uh, the order in answering the next question will be Molly, Andrew, Rupert and Amelia. 
Um, and the next question, question number five that's to be submitted is, what would the candidates do to ensure that the public, especially ethnic minorities, can have confidence in the Green Party's policies and core values? And I know that some of you have addressed this to um, greater or lesser extent in some of the stuff you've said before, but that's just what happens, isn't it, when we have in this kind of forum. So if I can ask Molly to address that question first. Yeah, I think the way people have confidence in you is because, as I said previously, the people that are representing your party look like they represent the, the country and the people they're seeking to represent. And that's particularly important, actually, in the House of Lords, where you're not elected. And where, as Amelia said, people tend to be extremely old and, and white and not really typical of people that live in this country. So I think I think it is important, particularly in the role we're applying for. Um, I've found these past few months of uh, Black Lives Matter really exhilarating and it's, it's really helped me as somebody who grew up in a very white community but very close to Bristol to um, play a part in Bristol politics and learn more about um, the minority communities that are there that I represented as an MEP and also working with Cleo um, who really helped me to get an insight into the sort of oppression that she faces on a daily basis. But what I've found so exhilarating over the past few months is that all the struggles are the same struggle. I think that's become really clear uh, through just through Black Lives Matter. And it's not I, I haven't felt that as something that I'm a bit embarrassed to be white anymore. I felt it as something that really enhances our message as Greens. And that's something also Cleo has done very effectively in linking through this Stop the Manga Measy idea. It's linking the ecological destruction with, with the oppression of minority communities. And it ties into our sort of colonial history and our history of exploitation of people and planet. So I think as Greens, we have, we have been really strengthening in terms of this agenda. And I think Greens of Colour have done amazing work and I've, I've worked with them um, and hopefully I think supported them to some extent. But I think, you know, seeing that statue, which we've all campaigned against in Bristol for such a long time, coming down finally through non-violent direct action, it was kind of a, a reinforcement of everything I believed about diversity politics, but also the power of, of direct action. And of course, Cleo was at the heart of that because she removed the, stat, the, the picture of the same guy from her office when she was Bristol mayor. And so, yeah, so, so I think mm, what we need to do as Greens is to kind of channel that amazing mobilization of okay. liberating energy that's coming. Great, okay, thank you so very much. And can we have Andrew next and remember to unmute. Okay, um, so I've mentioned already that I, I'm, uh, I represent an area with a large uh, Muslim population uh, and uh, I, I work directly with uh, a lot of folks from that, that community. Uh, I'm a school governor at a school with uh, a, a population with 90% uh, of its pupils uh, are from the uh, Asian uh, subcontinent. Um, so I definitely believe passionately in working directly with communities, working directly with people so that they know who you are, that, that, that uh, you're not talking um, about things that you simply don't know about. And, and standing by them in difficult times. Um, I, I spoke um, at a Black Lives Matter rally in Bradford uh, just last weekend. Uh, and, um, and, and I think it was important that somebody from the Green Party was there saying things and that, uh, that they knew that we were, we were on their side. Uh, in the area uh, I represent, I've, um, I've asked Kirklees Council to carry out a commission into the impact on people's, uh, of, uh, of black people's lives, of what happens in the area where they live around us. And so actually championing them, making sure that they know that we're, uh, we're actually standing up for, to ensure that their voices are heard is really, really important. Uh, and so that makes the Green Party real to them. It, it's not some, uh, a bunch of policies. Uh, it's that direct engagement with people which matters the most. Lovely. Thanks very much, Andrew. And Rupert, next. Yeah, so let me start out on this important question by mentioning that the ward where I live, where I was a two-term councillor, contains one of the most deprived council estates in Britain, with obviously many working class people and also some asylum seekers and so forth in it. And so that has given me very real hands-on experience of some of these matters over the last uh, 15 years or so. I'd like to also mention though something even bigger, which is that really what this question comes down to in the end, it seems to me, is the fact that we in the global north are a minority of the world's population, but we are responsible for a majority of the 
economic, ecological and climatic damage. Uh, and that damage is being wreaked primarily upon the global south. So to really show solidarity, we need to take the climate emergency seriously. We need to be accommodating and welcoming to climate refugees, which is something which I've stressed very strongly over the past few years. And I've got experience working in this area. I've worked closely with Kofi Klu of Stop the Manganese in my work in Extinction Rebellion and worked with a number of amazing leaders from black and ethnic minority backgrounds uh, in this country and around the world through Extinction Rebellion to try to ensure that we don't devastate uh, the global south and that instead we pursue climate justice with absolute seriousness and that as I already implied would be a key part of my agenda seconds. if I was uh, enabled to be uh, a lord. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and finally, Amelia. Oh, you remember to unmute, Amelia. Remember to unmute. I, yeah. I think it's really important that we talk about this not just from a Green Party perspective, but talk about diversity in politics as well. I think that we've got a problem uh, within our political, within our own party that we need to address. But the wider issue is also stark. I've worked quite closely with Dawn Butler on issues, again, around women's rights. And her experiences in the House of Parliament is disgraceful, where effectively even going to go and get lunch has meant that she's experienced abuse from actually members of the House of Lords. Um, and I think that we need to be making sure that we embed changes that need to happen, not just in our own internal reflections, but make change happen elsewhere as well, because politics is for too long been a very certain type of person. I've often been told that I don't look like a politician because, but what the hell does a politician look like when the reason that we all got involved in politics is because we want to make change happen. But beyond this, the intersectional elements, the experiences of being a woman of colour, of being uh, somebody with, of colour with disabilities, we need to be making sure that we are challenging all of these aspects to ensure that our, uh, when we're, we're talking about diversity, we acknowledge that not every single person's experience is the same. I've worked to make sure that we give a voice to those people. I worked at Grenfell Tower, making sure that, again, asking parliamentary questions on their experiences, but also when politics failed people, I worked to make sure that uh, there was a fund available for translation for that community, because to this day, 30 seconds. that council has never provided translation for emergency information for that pe people in that tower. And it was as a result of understanding my own power to make change happen that I was able to make sure that that was funded and that people were able to get the translations that they so vitally needed. Thank you so much. Perfect timing. Um, okay, so the, the order of the next question will be Rupert, Molly, Amelia and Andrew. Before we move on to the next question, can I just remind our attendees what's happening here, that we are working our way through some submitted questions which have been ordered in terms of the issues that they explore. You are invited, there are 66 of you just now, you are invited to submit questions on the Q&A because after this question we will take at least one from the Q&A. Um, some other people have submitted questions and you can upvote them if you wish. Um, so just to remind people that that opportunity is here that we will, after this next question, we will move to some questions from the Q&A and that's not in the chat, that's at the bottom of your screen and it's called Q&A. Uh, the chat is for technical issues, just for those who weren't here when that was first, first mooted. So moving on to question five, um, would, and we'll show that on the slide, thank you, would the candidates, what would the candidates do to ensure that the public, especially ethnic minorities, can have confidence? We have this one, Moira. Would, I'm sorry, so we have. Moira. So we have, so we have, I'm so sorry. It was good, but let's start it again. Yeah. <laughs> sure now, kind of another go. No, we're not going to take question six, thanks. We're going to, I want to take the first question um, from the Q&A, uh, Angela Thompson's question, which is, at the moment, it is a job for life. How do you think you would cope with a lifelong commitment? Yeah, so. And Rupert, Rupert first, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So obviously, uh, I've thought about uh, this. Um, I'm not quite as young as I look, so uh, it may not be quite as long as you uh, as you think. Uh, but yeah, still hopefully could be a while, um, especially if our civilization doesn't collapse, which uh, we'll be working on. Um, 
basically my answer to the question is that I'm champing at the bit to, to do this. Uh, and I think that it'll keep me going for quite a long time uh, uh, to come. I've been um, seeking to uh, make a move to the Lords for uh, a long time. I was in the first um, selection, I think I'm the only person here uh, who was in that uh, selection many years ago now. Um, and um, yeah, it's what I want to do. Um, what I would also be able to bring to the role, as I've already implied, is a connection from some very real world uh, activities, namely uh, other um, social and political movements that I'm involved with, and also the relevant parts of my academic work. So I don't think there's any likelihood that I would ever be bored. The work on the climate and ecological emergency is an entire, I mean, it's much more than a lifetime. Uh, and the dimensions that I've already highlighted, areas such as applying the precautionary principle, question, questioning uh, the natural capital uh, perspective, uh, trying to get um, adaptation taken seriously in a way it just isn't uh, at the moment. These things are precisely what I want to do uh, with the rest of my life. And I would just love to be uh, a parliamentarian working alongside uh, Natalie and, and Jenny and working alongside Caroline. And I hope also working alongside uh, some of my other uh, colleagues and rivals here on this call. Second. Second. Because of course we're producing a list of four here and hopefully we won't just get one, we could get, we could get several. And that's what we really ought to have because the Green Party is chronically underrepresented in the House of Lords. Let's see what we can do to change that. Thank you so much, Rupert. And then I'm inviting Molly to answer the question about how you would cope with a lifelong commitment. Thank you. I found this a bit of a surprising question when I first heard it, because for me, green politics is a lifelong commitment anyway, and I made that commitment 35 years ago. So it's just a question of what's the most useful place to be as a green politician. And for me, it seems the House of Lords is the next appropriate step. I mean, I have to say I really enjoyed having power as an MEP. I sort of gleeful about it sometimes, and I felt I exercised it in a way that was useful for green politics. And I'm heartbroken that I can't continue as an MEP. And I'm pissed off and heartbroken that I'm not in the House of Commons right now because obviously MPs have a lot more power than Lords. I think we have to admit that's true because they have that democratic authority. But nonetheless, I, I would now like to use the skills and experience I've got and the commitment I've made to green politics in the House of Lords with the power that's available there. And I think I could find ways to extend that power to make real change. Um, I'm actually going to be a grandma soon and so I feel that's like me moving on to the next stage and I'm kind of getting out of that bit where I'm constantly battling against annoying and not very good Labour politicians to try and get a seat in the House of Commons and moving into my sort of let's say my mature years um, and it feels to me like becoming a party grandee and um, a member of the House of Lords is appropriate for my life stage. Thank you so very much and congratulations on being a granny. <laughs> it's the very best. You can buy them chips and coke and ice cream <laughs> and red sweeties. It's just great. Lovely. Right. And Amelia next, please. Thank you. And congratulations, Molly. Um, I was also going to say I've made a lifelong commitment to the Green Party and to making change in politics. But I think uh, it's important to re recognise that to me, it, it shouldn't be a lifelong commitment to the House of Lords. I am committed to make sure that we abolish the House of Lords and have a proper elected second chamber. And if I continue to want to, to put myself forward for election um, after we've achieved that, because we have to achieve that. Our democracy is broken at the moment, whether that's proportional representation or an unelected House of Lords. Our democracy needs to change. And when one of my key motivations being in the House of Lords is to make that happen. Um, so yes, I hope it isn't a lifelong commitment. I do hope that once we've got a, a second elected chamber that I will continue to put myself forward. But change must happen and if it doesn't happen in our lifetimes then I think that we've probably failed as green politicians trying to make that fundamental shift to a more democratic system. That's great thanks very much Amelia and Andrew. Um, so, so yes abolish it or, or you're stuck there till you die uh, so you know that's 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 the, basically what you, you're faced with so uh, of course I, I agree with that um, uh, a job for life well I'm, I'm, I'm 55 <laughs> no <laughs> how did that happen um, uh, and um, for the last 20 years um, I've been a counsellor so I, I anticipate that 20 30 years 
uh, going forward, uh, I'd be a member of the House of Lords. And so you, you imagine what was as a councillor, you imagine what would be uh, uh, as a member of the House of Lords. And so that, that all seems uh, quite uh, imaginable. But I, I guess the, the Molly mentioned um, enjoy, enjoying things and excitement. It would be awful if you didn't enjoy it, if you would be awful if you didn't find it exciting and a great place to be to do positive, useful things. And that's why I would want to do it. I tell you what, I, I wouldn't want to do this when I was, um, you know, 30 years ago and think I've got 50, 60, 70 years in the House of Lords. That would drive me up the wall. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I can imagine 20, 20 or 30 years, I can imagine uh, that being a useful uh, thing for me to do at this part of my, uh, my political career, if I've ever had a political career. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the way I look at it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the next question will be answered in the following order. Andrew, Amelia, Rupert and Molly. Um, and I think I would like to take a number, the number six question that was pre-submitted, please, um, Louisa. And this is, what opportunities do you see for building alliances with other members in the House to further our aims? And where can we have the most impact? I will just wait for the, for the slide. Thank you so much, Louisa. And we're going to start with Andrew, but have a minute to read that. Okay. Okay, just shoot whenever you're ready. Fair dues. Um, so, um, obviously, one of the, the great things about the House of Lords, I mean, it's, it's actually voted against, it's got loads of Conservatives in it, but it's actually voted against government um, quite a lot very, very recently. And so, uh, there's obviously people in there who've got a very much an independent view of things, despite um, their party allegiances. And so, it, it, it's those relationships, which I know Jenny and Natalie have been building up, um, are, are, are valuable because um, we, we can't just go in there and assume that um, we're not going to talk to everybody and just talk from a Green Party perspective. I understand this very um, acutely because for the last 20 years uh, the council I represent has been hung. We've had uh, Lib Dem administrations, we've had Labour administrations, we've had Conservative administrations, just been a few votes short of, of, uh, of being able to get their budget passed. And so I've built strong, strong relationships with people across the political spectrum, even the Tories, uh, and, um, and worked with them to, uh, to, to get green policies achieved and passed. And that's about political leverage. Um, it's about personal relationships. It's about all those things. And I've obviously got those skills because I've achieved things um, with, um, in, in that situation. Uh, and so I'm used to doing that. I was used to doing that at the Committee of the Regions. Uh, one of the great things was that the Greens at the Committee of the Regions were in different political groups uh, because there weren't enough Greens to actually uh, form a group. And yeah, so, 30 seconds. And so working with them, we were able to work across um, those political groups and get consensus for things, which uh, at the, on the face of it often seemed quite radical. The only people I didn't manage to get on board with it was the uh, Conservatives in the Committee of the Region from the UK, who were just a really strange bunch of people who you couldn't generally work with. Thank you so much. And can we have Amelia next, please, for that question? Thank you. And I think um, we've all probably worked cross party in our own way. And I think that it's really important that uh, we, the House of Lords essentially is that you're not going to achieve anything unless you're willing to collaborate, especially as the Greens. It will be incredible, whoever, if any of us are selected to that House of Lords, that we'll have a group of three. And uh, the work that Jenny's had to do to bring build those alliances has been really inspiring because it's tough when you're out there on your own. Um, I think it's also important that while working together, and I've worked uh, across the board, would obviously never work with anyone from the from the far right, but we work across the board on making change happen. But uh, fundamentally, we also need to change the conversation in many ways. And I think that when you look at quite a lot of people who can be quite populist, I mean, look at even Boris Johnson at the moment, appropriating the language of, of build back better and trying to look green, that there's also a role of making sure that you change the conversation to make sure that our radical yet rational politics are what people want to be supporting and buy into. It's interesting seeing greens that I've worked with across Europe, the UK, and even um, some of the, I've worked with some of the African Greens uh, in the past, uh, that it's interesting their role of building those alliances on key issues. Those people won't always be the same, 
but making sure that you're talking about your priorities as a party people will come to you if you if they know what you represent and when you're proving that you are speaking out to to, to something that will have support <laughs> as a result of being able to change that national debate that national conversation as well so yes to building alliances yes to having experienced that but also let's change the conversation to make sure that the green agenda becomes the norm thank you so much amelia and can i now ask rupert about building alliances mm. So like Andy, I've got lots of experience of this kind of thing on the council. For the majority of the time that I was a councillor, there was no overall control. And indeed, for part of that period, we in the Green Party group, of course, this was Norwich, a very, very uh, large group. It was uh, 15 for most of the time I was on the council. Uh, we in the Green Party group actually did a kind of a deal with uh, the uh, Labour um, Party and did a, um, a letter of agreement with them, a memorandum of agreement, which was a very interesting process negotiating that. Uh, and this is, as the others before me have said, an absolutely vital thing for someone in the House of Lords to be able to do because no party ever has a majority on the House of Lords. I think that Jenny has led in an exemplary way on this. And I've seen her in action and I've backed her up on it. She has made strong working relationships with peers from all parties. She's made very strong relationships with, uh, with Labour peers, for example, um, uh, Alan Howarth, who uh, I've, I also know and have uh, worked with, who's a very green-minded uh, uh, Labour peer. Uh, she's made uh, strong relationships with some Conservatives, and indeed she sometimes sits on the Conservative side of the, of the Lords. Uh, which is unusual. It's not, you know, as sort of black and white as it is uh, on the Commons. And by doing that, although she invariably votes against uh, the government, she has forged uh, real relationships. I would aim to work in the same way as her, and indeed, as I've suggested earlier, earlier um, directly uh, alongside seconds. Uh, to, to do that. And I think there's a huge amount that can be achieved in the House of Lords on that basis. One last point. I would aspire as a Lord to create a committee for future generations um, in the House of Lords, which is something which it's possible for the House of Lords to do, but it hasn't actually quite done it yet. Uh, and that would be a great way, I think, to bring people from different parties together uh, and to make the, uh, the second house somewhere where we can really start to think long term, which is just so vital. Thank you so very much. And Molly. Because the European Parliament doesn't have a majority, everything is agreed by negotiation between parties. So it's absolutely the culture of how the European parties, uh, European Parliament works to always be working with other parties. And I think this idea that somehow you would manage in politics without working with other parties is a peculiarly, peculiarly British idea that comes out of our mad um, two party system and first past the post electoral system. So I think it's, it's, been, it's possible to reframe people's understanding of how politics works. And I've seen that happen with Labour and Conservative politicians who were elected to the European Parliament. And, you know, learning from the German model, where basically you don't take anything forward until everybody agrees. And that means rather than somebody then reversing it, you're all rejecting that this is my position, that's their position. And you're all basically trying to find the best for everybody. It may sound utopian, but it's how most democracies actually work. And I think taking that culture into the House of Lords would be really valuable. Obviously also it's important in the Lords to develop expertise. People will work with you if they think you know what you're doing and you're not just like some ridiculous drunk old toff or alternatively somebody who was a crony of one of the you know, dead politicians. Um, so the working peers, I think, respect each other for having expertise. And that's where I think my economics expertise would come in useful. And of course, we've got to remember as well that there are a lot of cross benches, a large chunk of lords who aren't signed up to any particular party. And so I think, you know, I think my green economist credentials are quite subversive in this setting because why shouldn't anybody really want to work with me? Now, like um, Rupert and Andrew, I live in Gloucestershire politics, so I understand the need to have to talk to Tories and work with them. But actually, there are ways in which they agree with us. You know, they do genuinely love the land and nature and things like that. And as I said, I've already made good relationships with farmers. And I think we're in an interesting time in British politics now where this idea of left and right Tories and Labour is breaking down. There are lots of soft Tories out there who are looking for people to work with and looking for a new type of politics. At the same time, there are a lot of uh, Corbynistas who are kind okay. of giving up on the Labour Party. So let's not be too narrow. Let's reject that two-party system and put green politics at the heart of what Lovely. happens in the Lords. Thank you very much indeed.
Um, thanks, everybody. The next order, and this is going to be the final question, the next order is uh, Rupert, Molly, Amelia, and Andrew will have the last word. That in mind, will be a pint the next time I see you in a bar. Remember those. We're going to have time for one more question, and I'm going to take a, the question, Emma Bateman's question, because we're staying with the theme here of alliances and collaboration and cooperation. And from the Q&A, Emma's question is, how are you going to engage with people who have fundamental disagreements with you? And furthermore, the question goes on, do you have the courage to discuss uncomfortable issues rather than ignore them? So that's a really easy question, Rupert, for you to have two minutes on. Yeah, so the, the simple answer to this very important question is yes. As I said at the start of my remarks uh, an hour and a half ago now, I believe strongly in robust debate and deliberation. That is what politics is. If we are having a conversation with somebody else, we, we don't get anywhere in that conversation if we go into that conversation saying, well, this is simply how it is. Uh, and if you don't accept that, then you're not even allowed to talk. That, that kind of approach will get us precisely nowhere in somewhere like uh, the House of Lords. Uh, unless, of course, the question in question uh, is a straight question of fact, such as, for example, a question about habitat destruction or something. You know, there's no room for, for uh, fake news and post-truth, but there has to be room for a proper debate and discussion. That is uh, what politics uh, is. And I believe we can do it so much better than the, way, than the way we've been doing it in our party. I think that the way we've been doing identity politics has, been, has become very harmful. Uh, and I want to just briefly mention an alternative model which we use in Extinction Rebellion, which is called co-liberation. And the idea in co-liberation is that we will only free ourselves if we free ourselves together. So rather than, falling, rather than forming smaller and smaller enclaves where we bash everybody who doesn't uh, go along with our claims to uh, be uh, the oppressed who have the only right to speak on our own oppression. Instead, we work together to liberate all of ourselves and we recognize that actually in the end, it's the system that is at fault. So we don't name and shame and blame. We criticize and work to change the system and we do it, and we do it together, aware that there won't ever be real freedom unless that freedom is Perfect. for the oppressors as well as for the uh, oppressed. Uh, that is a model that I would commend to the Green Party, and I think it could help make our culture of debate uh, a lot healthier. Uh, thanks for taking part in this debate uh, this morning. Thank you so very much um, for that. And Molly, that question for you. And you can see, you can all see the question on the chat, can't you? How you're engaging with people with yeah, fundamental so disagreements and uncomfortable I, I really value what, what Rupert said there, but I'm going to actually address this head on because I see that Emma Bateman asked this question in connection with women's sex based rights. And she's I've been using, thinking about this a lot that, recently. To, can we just be very clear that she's using that as an example? Yeah, but I think the example yeah. is important. And mm -hmm. I've um, recently had some exchange with B. Campbell. You might have seen she wrote an article mm -hmm. about me because I supported our party policy and she um, had, I think, assumed I wouldn't support our party policy. Um, and I would just say that anybody who makes a simplistic response to this particular agenda is uh, really belittling the, the depth of consideration that needs to be given to it. And I think it hasn't always been possible to give that depth of consideration because people were fearful of saying what they believe because they were fearful that they would come under attack. And I don't want to be in a party where people feel that way. Um, the absolute priority for me is supporting trans people who are at huge risk of violence. And so I think our policy does that and that's why I support it. But at the same time, I completely understand why other people feel that our policy attacks their fundamental rights and their identity. I don't think it does, but I think we need to convince them that it doesn't by debating with them and particularly by making the case for our policy. I think we reached a point of agreeing our policy and then just saying that's our policy. I think we need to do much better in order to protect trans people, build a majority for our policy, because there isn't a majority for it at the moment in the country, and that's a job for us to make that case. Um, but I also see that this is a culture war, and I think the reason I'm addressing this issue is it's just one issue which the government is going to throw into radical politics to try and undermine our effectiveness. And uh, uh, so far, we've allowed that to happen. We have to do a lot better. In, in, as the Greens, I think we have something really to offer here in being able to hear both sides, being able to respect both sides and being able to debate in a humane way. And that's something, you know, I'm also standing for the executive. That's something I'm committed to doing 
um, to, to ensuring that, that, that GPEX does. Because my view is the real threat to both women's and their sex-based rights and trans people comes from toxic masculinity. Um, as Rupert said, we need to all be working together to, re yeah. to, re to liberate ourselves and Thank to you. liberate men from the okay. too strong Thank in our you. society. Thank you very much indeed, Molly. And back to Amelia, and, and I'll just remind everybody um, about the question, which is fundamental engaging with people with fundamental disagreements with yourself and having the courage to discuss uncomfortable issues. So Amelia, and then finally, Andrew. A few years ago, one of my favorite things to do on the doorstep was to convert a UKIP voter. Um, there are less of them now, but effectively it's worth people were given a silver bullet to many of their problems and actually discussing common issues in a way that we were talking about while well, well, talking about um, migration obviously people said I'm not racist but but how you open that up into a conversation about what the problems actually are uh, it might be talking about the NHS it might be talking about jobs and by opening up that conversation to a point where there's kind of a shared understanding and knowledge enables a different platform to begin that conversation on. I think it's really important that we do uh, talk to people with different opinions and I'd also want to address the question in the chat box head on. Um, I think it's really important uh, to talk to people of all different experiences and, and different points and opinions. And I think that um, I know that Emma, I have uh, in the past, I think you've criticised me because I hide comments on my Facebook. I think it's really important that on my platforms, I'm not uh, making a point where effectively in this debate often trans people will end up part of that conversation rather than it being a conversation with myself directly and I think it's really important that when I work to represent the party that I'm also working to represent all aspects of that rather than cr potentially creating a dam uh, something that could be damaging for people. I I've worked to campaign on women's rights, it's one of my key priorities. But I've also listened to so many people uh, from different perspectives when it comes to this. I know that I've had my own journeys on understanding complex issues and uh, I think that everybody else seconds. probably has as well. Oh, you're muted now. Yes, that's fine. That's you done. Sorry, I didn't. Yes, yeah, wasn't kind of cutting you off. You had a few moments, a few seconds spare. Thank you so much. And the last word, Andrew, there we go now. Well, of course, the chair always has the last word. Dream on, you know. Thanks for that again. Um, I guess, <laughs> that was the last word. Um, sort it I, I out guess, for us. Okay. Um, if I could sort this one out, uh, I would be uh, a, a great person indeed. Um, active listening uh, for me is, is what uh, I think is, is often lacking um, in, the, in this area. Uh, and people actually really listening to what other people say and about what, what they're about. Uh, we have we have some there's some very entrenched uh, positions uh, on these and and uh, the, the, Molly described it as a culture war uh, and, uh, and 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 when you've got a culture war, people have their battle lines and they throw things at each other and uh, the words misogynist and transphobe have been thrown backwards and forwards here at people and and often I think uh, that those words don't don't often really apply to the, to those people uh, and that they simply have a different perspective and a different opinion and, and that there's not often a lot of r respect that, that is actually shown there. And I've been saddened really by all the stuff that's gone on in social media, the, the resignations on either side of this debate, um, the name calling uh, that, that, that's gone on. So uh, active listening should not be um, a radical suggestion. Uh, in the Green Party, uh, but I think it is, um, sadly, uh, at the moment. Um, so uh, I, I think we've got to do a lot more of that. Um, I think we have got to listen to views from people who, who we disagree with. Um, I, I, I note the comments of John, Jonathan Bartley um, that in a recent article he wrote where he said, one of the things that we've got to do as politicians, I, I, I paraphrase, I can't remember the exact word, wording, is not assume that, that everybody who doesn't agree with us is evil. Uh, yeah, uh, and, um, uh, and, um, uh, and that, uh, and we're not actually uh, in that space with a lot of people at the moment. And it's the people at the extremes often of, of this argument who, who um, are quite frightening. Um, and um, you, you look at, um, you look at how they approach things and how they approach their politics and um, yeah, it's, um, it, it's uncomfortable. Thank you so very much.
Right, that's all that we have time for. Can I thank our four candidates hugely? Um, hustings are never a kind of preferred way to spend a Saturday morning. I love uh, it. Speak for yourself. Don't be a sick person. <laughs> <laughs> Right, you all need to get out more. Okay, nice little walk in the fresh air. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Moira. <laughs> what, what was the last question? I'm, I'll send it to you. I'm, I'll send it, or Louisa will send it to you. Um, no, we're very grateful for all of you, but can I also hugely, as a whole team of people, as you know, that make these hustings work, any kind of hustings, and Louisa and her team were phenomenal, and particularly today, can I express huge appreciation to Martin and Louisa, who've been kind of managing the chat and managing the Q&A, because as a chair, you know, as you can see, it's not all, you don't always get everything right, you have a couple of different things to juggle, and I couldn't have done that at all without Louisa and Martin. So thank you very much to them. Thank you for all the, the people who attended. Um, and it, like, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Well, of course it's no longer, it's kind of every day to us now, isn't it? This, this attending. I was watching a Bond movie with my son, you see, I really have a life last night. And they were doing video conferencing to show how cool they were. Well, you know, like five-year-olds do video conferencing now. But, as for, but you participants, you attendees, I appreciate very much your attending your attendance and your attention and your engagement um, that's tremendously important to us in terms of the internal democracy of our party so thank you so very much for that thank you it, thanks anybody? everyone thank you. okay thanks very thank you all Bye. and of course we should, <sighs> wish, we should wish we're still online i think um, right. and we should we should wish our candidates our candidates all the very best of course yeah, may we all end up in the House of Lords, like I said. <laughs> yes, that's right. There were some such very interesting questions, actually, um, on there. Yeah. But Good. We're, we're still recording and we're still on it. But it was, and there was a question I would have liked to be able to ask about communications in terms of the disabled community. So, anyway, thank you all very much. Um, yes, thanks, Maura. Thanks, thanks particularly to Louisa. Uh, for making it all happen and Martin for managing all that chat. And yeah. well done everyone. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, one, only 28,000 more hustings to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Get out in the sunshine. Bye. Yeah.